yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Well, I was at City College in my, in my senior year, and I decided to, to join the Navy, if I could, and get into uh, officer training school. And at that time, the Navy had a ship uh, anchored right off, uh, right off 116th Street, and that was used to interview candidates for the V7 program to become a naval officer. So I, I went down there, and... Uh, I, I was an Eagle Scout, which they liked very much, uh, and of course I was, and I was accepted for the Officer Candidate School. Well, for me, the transition to the Navy was not difficult because I had been a Boy Scout and had worked in the summer of Brooklyn's Boy Scout camps for summers. In fact, I was the scoutmaster of a camp of 60-some-odd kids. So. Um, uh, that kind of life was not unusual for me, you know. Uh, I knew what it was to live in a, a, bunk, a, a bunk room that had 20, 30 people sleeping there. We were, you know, we lived in tents with 12 or 15 kids. So I had, uh, I had no problem with that adjustment. Well, we, we really had an enormous education in... Um, uh, we, we were, when I was at the Naval Academy, for example, uh, we not only learned how to use the signal book uh, and to send signals both, uh, both by radio and, and with flags. Uh, we knew how to, uh, we all knew how to box the compass. We, 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 we understood the methods of communication between ships and, and don't forget each ship had a, 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 had a signal, a radio shack that we called it a radio shack. It was not, a, not the name of a chain of stores at that time. And, and we could pick up signals from, from Hawaii that had the news and so on. So we were in communication with the world as well as within our own task group. I served in, in, as, a, as a decoder because they taught us how. We had decoding machines that were uh, very sophisticated and uh, they were very secret. And we learned how to handle those those decoding machines. And my job was to decode messages, to send messages. And my job was also to bring messages to the captain. And the captain was a, what they, we called a martinet, a tough guy. And if you didn't have the answers to his questions, he could be ruthless. So we were trained to know what we had to know and to know it in detail. Uh, so I did that and then after we were hit by a suicide plane, the day that I died but was resurrected, what happened was that we would go topside. My, the, the, the head of my department, the communications department, Lane Koss was his name, we would go topside to watch the action. We would want to see the planes get shot down. We were under, the carriers were always under attack because they were the heart and soul of our, of, of our attack force. And he had a great pair of binoculars, which we would go topside and, and try to view the action. And it became a daily routine and almost boring. You know, someone once said, I don't know who, said that the whole concept of heaven and hell is silly because after two weeks you get used to it. Well, we got used to that action. And here I was decoding a message, and Lane says to me, come on, Mel, let's go topside and, and see the action which we've been doing almost every day. 
And I said, look, Lane, I said, I've got to finish this thing. You go ahead, I'll catch up with you later on. Well, he starts going topside from the radio shack to the signal bridge. I'm decoding. And I hear our five-inch guns go off. That was the largest gun we had. Well, that doesn't mean it's an attack on our ship. You could use the five-inch guns to shoot at other planes that are attacking other ships. Then our 60-millimeter guns went off. That still doesn't necessarily mean it's us that's under attack. But when the 40 caliber machine guns went off, I just held on tight, and there was a big explosion. I was knocked off my seat. That was all that happened to me. But poor Lane Koss disappeared. He had just gotten on the signal bridge, and that's where the suicide plane hit. So I made the decision that day that I really had been killed, but magically resurrected. And from now on, everything's free. My worst moment on the USS Lexington was a day that I was almost celebrating. Do you remember the movie uh, the, about the Titanic where, where DiCaprio was standing in the bow of, of, the, of the Titanic and the wind is blowing at him and he's celebrating that, that moment? That's what I was doing. I was, I was in the bow all alone of the, of the ship and it's, bend, you know, it's plunging and rising and plunging and rising and we, unbeknownst to me, above me was the hangar deck. Yeah. Or, I'm not sorry, the flight deck. I was, I was on level with the hangar deck, and we were landing aircraft. And you know, when you're landing aircraft, if the, the plane isn't in the best possible position for a landing, the landing signal officer gives you a wave off. But the plane has already been losing airspeed. So now I'm, I'm in, in the bow celebrating the wind and the sun and, 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 the, and the foam of the, of, of, you know, of, the, of the ocean, and this plane comes alongside and lands in the water just in front of me, and I'm looking down, and the pilot is trying to open the canopy, and he can't. And he looks up and he sees me, and I see him. And that was it. He went under. Our attitude toward the Japanese during, during the war in the Pacific as a sailor on a, on, a, on a vessel, particularly an aircraft carrier, was not, not of contempt but of pity because our pilots were so superior to theirs and, and they were so, don't forget they had lost at the Battle of Midway, they lost the core of their, of their carrier air force. And they never recovered from that. And I, and I was in the Battle of the Marianas. Battle of the Marianas, we were outmaneuvered by the Japanese. They had Tinian, Rota, and Saipan. And Rota had air, air landing strips. And we were 150 miles away, and they were able to be from 300 miles away, or thereabouts, to attack our fleet and land in Rota. And we couldn't attack them because they were out of our range. If it had been the other way round, there would have been no ship left in the Japanese Navy that was afloat at that time. Not one plane got through it. We, we, we launched aircraft intercepted at 80 miles by radar, picked them up at radar, at 80 miles from the formation. It was called the Marianas Turkey Shoot. One plane got through and dropped a bomb on the South Dakota, a battleship, and it landed on top of a 16-inch turret. And the guys, <laughs> and then exploded upwards. The guys, in the, in the turret with the 16-inch gun, didn't even know what had happened. It hadn't affected them at all. That also led to the following day when Admiral Mitcher said, let's find them, and we didn't find them till about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and launched aircraft. And the question was, could we, get, could we launch an attack and have the planes return? 
and they would be returning after dark. Well, the attack was, was quite successful, and now planes are coming back. And here is the fleet. You know, if you were topside at night and you lit a cigarette, a submarine could see that as if, as if it was a flare. And we had to land the aircraft after dark. And Mitchell lit up the fleet. And the whole fleet was lit up like daylight. And, and pilots were coming aboard or, or landing in the water nearby and being picked up by destroyers. An unbelievable, an unbelievable thing to see. I never had any hostility to the Japanese. Uh, I never had, I told you I had pity for their ineptitude, their relative ineptitude, admiration for the skill of our sailors, pilots. They were heroes to us. When I was a kid, made in Japan meant poor quality. But there was a very brilliant American who was talking quality right after the war and we really didn't want to listen. Certainly General Motors didn't listen. They would own 54% of the market. They were riding high. Whatever they made got sold, you know, because everybody wanted a car. And this guy was adopted by the Japanese after the war and taught them, I forget his name, but he taught them that the idea that if you make a quality product and you get a loyal customer, that customer is going to spread the word. And they bought it all the way. And then they, and they became who they are. I had to admire that. They became a very different people than they were and, and, and became, you know, amazingly a democracy from having been a, a what, an a, 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 a imperial power, you know. Remember a kid from Brooklyn who, who was, grew up in the Depression and uh, you, went to, you went to college and studied sand piles, you know. Uh, uh, you took a course, uh, in, in courses in economics and literature, and you were qualified for nothing. And, and you, what kind of a job am I going to have? Where will, I, where will I find my place in life? How will I make a living? And coming out of the Navy and having everything free because I didn't, I didn't die that day, I said, I, I can do it. So it gave me a sense of self, gave me a range of experience that we didn't have on, on 46th Street in Borough Park. You know what's interesting? You asked me about memorable moments. Uh, I remember being on my battle station on the bridge. It's 1945. And we're under attack and wearing flash-proof clothing. You wear flash-proof clothing because if there's an explosion, a heat wave from the explosion, if you're, any exposed skin sh gets shriveled. So we're wearing flash-proof clothing. The ship is under attack. We're shooting at enemy planes. And word comes that the atom bomb has been dropped. Now think about it. What was my reaction? I was overjoyed. I was overjoyed. I was going to live. I thought I was going to go into the Navy. But uh, when they learned that I had had pneumonia a couple of months earlier, they said no. <laughs> so I walked down the street and found a Coast Guard recruiting station. And that's how I got into the Coast Guard. I went in as a candidate and was sent up to uh, New London, where the Coast Guard Academy is, and uh, became an ensign. You know, they knew that as a female, I wasn't going to be leaving the country because at that time, the only, pe only women who were going abroad were in the army, wax. And uh, the rest of us were imprisoned in the United States. I went to Washington, D.C. 
because I was going to be an intelligence officer, because I had come out of the FBI to go into the Coast Guard. So they wanted to give me some training at uh, Coast Guard headquarters in Washington. And I stayed there, I think, about a month. And I, now, remember, I'm in Cleveland. So there, there were funny things happened in Cleveland, but there, were all, there was also a lot of traffic, and we were supposed to be um, on guard because of the wartime situation. So my boss said, I want you to get a driver and go down to, uh, he named the, the pier in Cleveland. And I said, what do I do when I get down there? He said, call me back when you get there, and I'll tell you. So when I went down, there were two funny looking little men standing there. And they were handcuffed. And they were in brown suits. So the uh, CO of this Coast Guard ship down there greeted me and I said, what are these guys doing here? He said, we picked them up, up in the northern part of the lake, because they had been driving a, they had been rowing a broken down old uh, canoe, and they were going to drown if we didn't pick them up. So I said, they, they don't look American. He said, no, they're not. They're German POWs who were in the Canadian camp on the other side of the lake, and they saw this boat, and they just jumped into it. So I said, and what am I to do with them? Well, the only thing there is to do with them is to get them into that car you brought down with you and take them to the FBI down on Main Street here in Cleveland. So that's what I did. <laughs> and I said to them, I figured they knew enough English if they had stayed in a Canadian camp. And I said, why did you do that? And they said to me, because the food is better here. <laughs> what I enjoyed in the military was uh, meeting new people, going to new places, going to a place like Cleveland, Ohio for my uh, assignment, and uh, surviving it all, ultimately. My most positive is the young women I trained after I got off active duty and stayed in the reserve. And I, uh, I trained them, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a picture of that. I have a picture in my kitchen at home. <laughs> but uh, down near, near Williamsburg, Virginia, and I trained, I don't know how many groups of young women who were then joining the Coast Guard after the end of the war. I have often wondered why, why the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. I, has anybody ever asked them, do, do they know? <laughs> I really do wonder why, why, what did they hope to, to win? A big country like ours? I went to college in 1941. The President of Queens College announced the day after President Roosevelt said, 
this is a day of infamy. That's when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And we all ran to enlist. And they needed officers, especially naval officers. And they would not let us enlist unless we finished our graduation, which was six months later. So I went to, graduated in 42, went to Northwestern University and became what is known as a 90-day wonder. I guess the wonder is how did we win the war, but that was how it started. I served, uh, did a lot of mine warfare stuff out of New York Harbor, sweeping all the ships out of uh, that time. We used to have all different types of mines we had to sweep for. Then I, I was a navigation officer. And, and I took a float, three, three other, they call them YMS or minesweepers. We took a flotilla of, of uh, Liberty ships from New York to Brazeria, North Africa, which was this hopping point from to Sicily. Took, we had to take zigzag action and smoke signals to, to get there. It took us over three weeks with this group of ships. There were three minesweepers, I think, and one uh, destroyer escort. And we had to go through the Straits of Gibraltar. And we were bombed the Straits, we tried to go through there, but we got by all right. And then it took it, we had to go all the way to Bizzardi, which is a long time, the entire length of the Mediterranean, basically. And when I got there, these flares were coming, and I looked up, brilliant statement, they must be our planes, they're dropping recognition signals. They were the first radio controlled bombs the Germans were dropping. <laughs> so a few of us, a few, not us, but a few of us just got blown up. I got very famous for that one. I was involved with all of the mine sweeping that had to do with the northern Mediterranean from Anzi on up through Toulon. And people don't realize mine sweeping had to be done before any PT boat or anybody else could get into it. I, I was fine. I'm not trying to be a, a shower, but without sweeping mines, nobody could have gotten into the channels. Especially when you had uh, the Secretary of Navy at Forest on those times in a battle wag, where I could say, you must sweep those channels at all costs. We were shooting at each other. To try to, we, once the vines came up, we had to dispose of them. We were sweeping for the Queen Mary once, in, in very due diligence. And the, the Queen Mary passed us by with the troops on board, and all that, they laughed at us who went right by us. <laughs> so sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't. You had four types of mines. You had contact, which means they were on a cable, set to predetermined depth. In other words, they're very smart the way they, they would that how far they wanted, how deep a ship they wanted to get, not waste time on a small ship. So they predetermined the height or depth of the contact mine. Those are the ones with the whole thorns. If you hit a thorn, the whole thing will blow up. Then you had, that was for channel, I mean for harbors. For channels, you had magnetic mines, which were laid down with the idea of the uh, electric part of the ship going through would set the magnetic mine up. With that, we had tremendous cables, about six inches wide. One, part, one charge going out about 200 yards, and the other on the other side, 100 yards. And we throw, put a electrical force through one, positive one, and negative the other, so we'd have a magnetic field that would blow up any uh, magnetic mines. The third type was acoustic. I think I told you about that. That was for the, the, the screws of the ship's propellers going through the water. The acoustic was, because if I, I had the uh, chart or something, we lower this big hammer equipment about 10 feet into the water or less, what, we could determine that. And this big hammer would just keep banging, banging, banging away. And that was theoretically determined where the, where the ships were so we could bomb them. Mine warfare was a unique situation. I started out with a 136 foot called YMS. The equipment they had was amazing. You had a, a, a hammer at the top of the ship, big acoustic bang like that, like a, supposed to sound like the screws of a ship going through the water. You lower that in the water and bang, 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 bang. And supposedly, it did work. We used to, it used to pick up the uh, propellers of the ships by submarines going nearby by the fact that we had that. Then we had what, the depth charges, which were launchers with big batches of ammunition. We, we shipped, the, pushed, shipped the depth charges into the water to where we thought the 
submarines might be and have them explode. It was very rudimentary. Matter of fact, when we first started out from midshipman school in 1942 in the uh, New York Harbor, we had three types of sweep, uh, sweeping. We had contact, net, net, uh, magnetic, and acoustic. And our, our equipment at that time, which was so ridiculous, we did not have proper radar, so we would use sonar equipment to change the depth of the water. If the, the depth changed, you presume there was a submarine underneath. <laughs> then you take your 25-hour depth chart <laughs> and pull the plug and drop it. By the time it got down there, the submarine was 20 miles away. But well, we tried. Then it got more sophisticated after that. Just the thought about what the Japanese might have done, they were close to invading the West Coast, to think about how close they came and how unprepared we were for something like that. I remember this Kimmel and the other guy very well. You can't fault them, but in retrospect, why were we more prepared on Pearl Harbor, especially when there were, there were notices going on? As a matter of fact, December 6th, the day before, which was horribly done, the two ambassadors from Japan were in Washington, D.C., trying to negotiate a piece of something, which was a ploy, obviously, because the next day, that's where they were on Pearl Harbor, and nobody was prepared in a million years. I was, but what I do know is, when it came to America, when the time was ripe, America responded. I, I'll never be anything but the proudest in the world to be an American and have served in the American uh, uh, military.